come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, where a movie review podcast comes your way every Saturday night, whether you're ready for it or not. We're on a quest for total world domination, and all that we ask of you is that you go over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button, give us a review, all that stuff helps us get found by more people like you who are interested in the same things that you are. Uh, These are the internet radio superstars. Holly. Michaela. Sean. And I'm Colin. And tonight... We are bringing you our annual <laughs> best movies. Movies chosen by the year 2020. <laughs> Entertainment <laughs> chosen by the year 2020. Yeah, whatever that ends up being in this <laughs> fraught, fraught, fraught year. Well, you remember when we used to do these, uh, these were, we do like our top five uh, favorite and one worst movie of the year. Yep. Um, but then uh, this year has been an unusual year for movies. And uh, most of them haven't come out yet. Uh, we have been trying to keep current on everything that has been uh, uh, coming down the streaming pipeline. But, you know, it was like some people see some things and other people see others. Yeah. And There's so, a lot I missed this year. Yeah. I think we all did. I think uh, we've missed There's the holes and everything because um, you don't have that one place where you can go to see the movie in the theater. So we tried to mix it up. Uh, what what we come up with uh, this year? What are we going to do? We're having our yearbook episode. So, and you know how you, in high school, you Who, have like... Who's cutest couple? Yeah, cutest couple. Me and Colin. Oh, you guys. And we're doing this on Zoom, so now you can like change your background and put up I was going to say uh, Igor in the mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not cute at all. No, nothing about Igor is cute. Remember when we used to beat Igor? We did used to beat Igor. I know. He's got a, a lot easier recently. Right? Yeah. We're, of course, doing all right. talking about our famous mailman, Igor, the mailman, who brings us your mail. Uh, we should probably, off the top here, let uh, people know how they can get a hold of us, and we'll read your mail on the air. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. On Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. So uh, tonight, I guess, Michaela, why don't you tell us how we're going to get started off here? All right. So our first uh, 2020 superlative is going to be favorite TV show. And we're going to kick it off with Colin. All right. Well, um, since, uh, I mean, I guess I haven't been watching a whole lot of TV shows, so I think I've seen like two maybe the entire way through. And so my pick for 2020's best TV series. Oh, actually, I did see another one. I'm going to go with The Mandalorian <laughs> season two. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because you sit there and you go like you see so many, you know, all the Star Wars stuff. It seems like there's Star Wars this and Star Wars that. And then after a while, you kind of get, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you say? Like uh numb to it you know yeah and it starts to kill that little part of you that was a kid who saw these star wars movies and loved them right you loved them because like even i you know socially that part of you that could still feel joy yes that is exactly (laughs) it because even though i give return of the jedi some shit i still love all of those movies right i just recognize that you know you get older and you look at but the mandalorian is like one of those shows where uh john favreau and the guy from uh, the Clone Wars TV show. Dave Filoni. Thank you very much. Uh, have like uh, shouldered the entire burden of the Star Wars universe, uh, trying to make something that uh, that satisfies the actual fan base. And somehow that's by doing a Western lone wolf and cub. Who knew? Making like a samurai, uh, you know, Star Wars show. Um I don't know this stuff uh, in the second season too. I think it expanded on some of the things that they laid down in the first season. It's, it wraps up with, uh, you know, no sports, 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 but um, you know, it's like, this is a great uh, kind of nod to the people who really love star Wars and, and hoped for it to go certain ways, you know, in the new movies that didn't. And uh, it's like a course correction. Uh, 
I don't know. I really, really dug it. So we're going to find out next. From Remember last well, year when I broke the rules and put it in my top five? Yeah. That? Yeah. 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 You did. Couldn't wait a year, could you? <laughs> we, 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 if you're here long enough, yes, we just Sean, mold, I we just mold around this. the people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Sean, because I could have predicted this is how our episode was going to go this year. How could you not? Well, that means Um, this could be showing up a couple times. Who knows? Sean, what was your top TV show of 2020? Uh, I have a question for you, Colin. Uh, First of all, what was your... You were down to like two TV shows. What was your other TV show if it wasn't going to be The Mandalorian? Well, I remember the third one. shows you watched this year. Okay, so the other one is uh, Cobra Kai Season 2. That was the other show that I watched. But I think I enjoyed The Mandalorian uh, more. No, I also watched The Haunting of Bly Manor, which was not as good as The Haunting of Hill House. So those were the three. This is my rank. Top three. We're going with top one Mandalorian. Sean, where are you at? Top... TV show. In this is uh, in TV search. Uh, Cobra Kai was 2019. Was the last set of episodes that came out, wasn't it? Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay then. Take I checked the dates on it, so it's a good thing. Well, it's a good thing you picked Mandalorian because that's what I was going to bring up. I don't know that that really matters though this year. Well, in, it can Let's go in a real? different category. Let me put it this way: it's in a different one of my categories. Oh. But oh. If we're going if we're if we're going by the rules, then it is not a 2020 show anyway. Gotcha. Um, what premiered this year that I found fascinating? Um, it was a docu series called The Last Dance about oh, yeah. the 1990s Bulls franchise. In like unprecedented, they filmed um, because they thought it was going to be the last year that the Bulls were going to be together. They allowed a documentary crew or a camera crew to film everything of Jordan's last year on the Bulls. So they got unprecedented access, and the story they tell through, I think it's a 10-part series, um, is really fantastic. They, they, the last season is the kind of broader storytelling arc, but then they flash back to the origins of every basket, uh, like Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan, Dennis Rodman, Tony Kukoc, the origins of how all these great players came to the Bulls. And for someone who grew up in the 90s and was like, you know, uh, the Bulls were never bigger. Michael Jordan was the greatest thing in sports. Uh, you know, it's my home basketball team. Like, I grew up watching this, their entire run through the playoffs and finals. Uh, so this was a fascinating show for me to watch. And it uh, it really showed a different part of Michael Jordan and everybody involved, how sort of Scottie Pippen was treated during his last years on the team. But it's a fascinating view of, like, a big 90s event. Um, so... Uh, the Last Dance. Uh, I believe it's on Netflix now. It debuted on ESPN, uh, but that was my favorite show of this year. Oh yeah, we have to say uh, I saw Mandalorian on Disney Plus. Okay, sorry. <laughs> don't plug one. Disney. No, we don't need. <laughs> we don't need them. They don't need our money. <laughs> they don't need our money. You either, Netflix. Uh, all right, that is mine. Uh, Holly, favorite TV show of the year. And if I say you can't say Mandalorian, what happens? Um, well, I could go to my next pick if you want, but okay. I was going to no. say Mandalorian. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I, w- I was going back and forth between two, though. I was thinking Mandalorian, but I also watched a, um, a docu- I also watched a docu-series that I was kind of obsessed with. It's called Seduced. Uh, it's on Stars, and it's about the uh, Nexium sex cult, and it's fucking amazing. I know everyone was talking about The Vow, but this one is way better because it gets into like the nitty gritty, like it gets into like the real underbelly of what was really going on. Like I watched the vow and I kept thinking, okay, I, like it doesn't sa- like, I know it's bad, but I'm like, you got to tell me more because right now I'm like, okay, it doesn't sound that bad. I don't know. That was just me. Like I just, all right, let's everybody keep an eye on Holly. No, like I needed more detail. Like I, like I get that it was a bad thing, but I was like, you're holding out, like you're holding back. I need to know more detail of why it was so bad. They did take a long time to get to that point. Yeah, it took, it was a very long, like slow burn of a docuseries. The vow gets right into it or not the vow seduced gets right into it. Like you get, you get behind the scenes clips of the leader, Keith Ranieri. In the first, like, minute and a half, you see a clip of him saying, can you imagine how you can rape a baby? I can make it very rapeable. Like, oh, that's wow. the first minute and a half. I'm like, okay, now we're getting to it. Now I'm understanding why this was so fucked up. 
So if you want a docu series about about the Nexium cult that was amazing, watch Seduced. It was awesome. Yeah, if that uh, if that soundbite didn't didn't catch your eye or catch your yeah. ear to get you to watch it. Right. So I'm not saying like watching the I wasn't like, oh, this isn't bad. Like, what's the big deal? Like, it was bad, but I was like, okay, I want to know more because I feel like you're holding out. Seduce didn't hold out. They gave you a lot more, and it's it, he's a real monster. It was a fucked up cult, and it's very interesting. Watch Seduce, don't watch the bow. So um, well. I, I went on a little, I, I went on a little rant about that because I really was torn between the Mandalorian and Seduce, and Colin already talked about the Mandalorian. So I'm kind of just going to add a couple more thoughts to piggyback um, because Mandalorian was my favorite as far as like entertainment wise. I thought it was amazing. I don't think you need to love Star Wars to like the Mandalorian. I think it helps if you enjoy a Western style. Like, you know, you said it's Lone Wolf and Cub. It is absolutely Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, I, I think and I think everyone that watches it could get enjoyment out of it. I think a lot of people turn their nose up at Star Wars like, oh, I don't I don't watch Star Wars. I think those people might still enjoy the show. And to me, that's true entertainment. Like that John Favre is an expert. Like he I don't think he gets enough credit. I think he is an amazing filmmaker. I think he's he's not just a Star Wars fanboy, but the fact that he is helps. He's also credible and he's also just really good at what he does. And that really comes across. I think he should be given the reins to Star Wars. That's just my opinion. Mm. <laughs> but um, it's uh, looking at like the CGI, we all talk about how we like practical effects. We get tired of, of like mainstream CGI, but in Star Wars, we need it and we expect it. And in this, it works. Like I don't hate all the CGI. It, it enhances it. it. It's a really beautifully shot show. It's, it's just, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Like every episode brought something new to the table. And uh, yeah, this was my first year. I I also debated being this my like new to me show because I just started watching it this year. So I watched season one and season two. Um, but yeah, it's it's good TV, man. It's real good TV. So Did Mandalorian you... is my official pick, even though I recommend to do uh -huh. Mandalorian is my official pick. So, did you watch that? Uh, there's a documentary on the making of the show, mm -hmm. um, and they show like they created this crazy. It's like the volume, but it's it it doesn't. They don't use blue screens anymore. This is like mm -hmm. it, it's all projected in like 3D on these walls and on the ceiling and all that. And so you know the reflections actually from the environment are on. Uh, you know the Mandalorian is all uh, shiny. It's like, uh, and the actors are like, this is great, because now we don't have to imagine what's there. We actually get to see it. It's like, it comes across, I think. It's pretty cool. I think so, too. Yeah. And that Dave Filoni guy, I think he's like, uh, you know, I, we talk about John Favreau, and obviously he's the guy holding the whole thing together. But Filoni, Filoni, I think, uh, he's like the Star Wars, like, nuts and bolts, knows all the, you know, he's the Kevin yeah. Feige of <laughs> that show, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Michaela. What so I'm glad you guys talked about the Mandalorian and now you've caught up to me last year uh, it, <laughs> where I was last year. So welcome to the party. Um, yeah. When I was at star Wars celebration in 2019, I saw the Mandalorian panel and it was really weird because they couldn't like, it was a panel, but they couldn't talk about the show like at all. Like there was no mention of baby Yoda. None of that. It was just like, it's going to be about a bounty hunter. <laughs> Come watch it. Like, and that was it. And it was Carl Weathers, Gina Carano, and Pedro Pascal, John Favreau, and Dave Filoni on the panel. And I saw Dave Filoni and John Favreau walking around the convention floor. And I was like, oh, should I go talk to him? Should I not? And I, I didn't. But now I'm like, damn it, I should have. Should have just gone and gotten my picture with both of them. But yeah. Holly and I talk about off mic all the time that people need to put respect on John Favreau's name. Like, I think he gets considered to be like too palatable and too mainstream. <laughs> but the dude's created so many French multi-billion dollar franchises. He launched the MCU. He created a Christmas classic with elf, which it's really hard to make a new timeless Christmas movie. Yeah. And then he, he, he saved the sinking ship that was star Wars. Like it was not in good shape before the Mandalorian came out and, and this really righted the ship. So I think we all need to respect John Favreau a bit. For sure. Um, but since I, I picked the Mandalorian last year and since you guys talked about it and picked it, I'm going to pick something different this year. 
and I'm going to go with the Amazon Prime original, The Boys. Mm. So oh. it's a terrible, terrible name for a great show. Um, <laughs> it is based on a Garth Ennis graphic novel um, who also wrote Preacher and Hitman. And then he did a short series that I'm probably the only person that's ever read called Just a Pilgrim. And The Boys is is basically like, what if there was superheroes, but they were owned by a corporate entity and controlled by a corporate entity? And how would that look? And how would they be managed? Um, it also, its thesis statement is kind of uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's a really interesting path to go down. The na- it's called The Boys because Jack Quaid and Carl Urban kind of form this like counterculture group that kind of keeps the superheroes in check. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's just a terrible name for a really great show. If you really like watching like a Patrick Bateman type character navigate the world trying to pass for a normal person when they're clearly a psychopath, this is like the show you should be watching because Anthony Starr is doing like Emmy level work in a year that he's never going to get recognized for it, I'm sure. Is that Homelander? Yeah. yeah. He's incredible. Uh, it's it's really inclusive. It's really refreshing. I feel more connected to the female heroes in this show than any Marvel heroes I've ever watched. It gives so much more opportunity to people like that. Like in, And they call themselves out on that stuff and they check themselves all the time. The thing with Garth and his properties is they can be a little too edgelordy sometimes, but having it adapted into a TV show where you have other people writing it and kind of massaging it makes it a lot more palatable but i would encourage you all to check it out you all would love it it's super gory and violent really adult but like but it makes really good points about those things and it's just really i really love being like you know how would a corporate entity really micromanage an actual superhero and it makes me think like maybe disney does do things like this with their actors sometimes (laughs) and curates their image to this degree i wouldn't be surprised at all so I definitely, definitely cannot recommend enough The Boys on Amazon Prime. Season one and two are both incredible. Nice. That's been on my nice. list for a while. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. So that's best TV show of 2020. Next up, Michaela, what do we got? It is going to be our new to you category. So this is something older, not necessarily new this year that you rediscovered. And that'd be uh, starting off again. Sorry. Uh. Okay, so, yeah. Stop smoking. Right. I went off the uh, reservation here because usually we do more, you know, like sci-fi horror stuff. But the movie, I think, that impressed me the most that I saw this year that was an older movie was uh, Shane. (laughs) Right? We've talked about this on several episodes, right? Because when was the last? Steel Dawn, right? Was basically. Yeah, I was like, did you watch it after we watched Steel Dawn? (laughs) Well, I put it, I'm like, we talk about this damn movie because we we also did Malone, right? Which was another (laughs) paraphrase of of Shane. So I went back and actually watched the original film. And I'm like, this is like the Western story that like the, that the, the whole genre feels like is contained in this movie, um, you know, for those of you who don't know Shane, I mean, it's a classic novel, and then you know, it's the gunfighter who's trying to, you know, uh, you know, hang up his spurs, and ends up in a conflict with a family of ranchers. He's protecting them, um, but man, uh, you know, for um, the time that this was made, which I believe, sorry, now going back, I'm not sure if it was 50s or 60s, um, was like the way that they're speaking in that movie is about um you know themes that are still relevant in america to this day i mean it still seems like it's a current topical movie and it was just like i was struck by how many you know how layered it was i'm like it's a really smart script i mean it was like uh i was very very impressed by uh by the film and um we keep saying like jack palance you know, it's like uh, he's the guy that uh, that I always remember from that movie just because he's this, uh, you know, hired gunslinger that comes in and he's just like, uh, I'm not saying evil because he's like a paid guy who's just doing a job, but like lethal, you know, it's like yeah. he's a scary guy, you know, it comes across in that performance. The only thing um, I think, uh, you know, the lead actor, um, which was Alan Ladd. Mm. seems a little bit um too clean cut like if you could remake the movie with uh you know um um he does seem a little soft doesn't he like yeah, he's for, not 
like he wasn't the he didn't like have the attitude that he says, "Ah, that's all in my past and everything. He doesn't quite live up to that. Like he, they used to pick up the gun and yeah, you know, that he was feared by people. He's not rugged enough. I think that was my, that was my only problem. I didn't necessarily, I mean, like the, the guy is a great actor and the script is carrying it out. It's like, this guy has blood on his hands, right? Like he did some awful shit uh, in the past and he's trying to get rid of it, but it's Alan led. And you're like, I mean, this guy looks like a 1950s, you know, like a, a matinee idol. And that's where it's like, but man, if you had Clint Eastwood in that part, you know, and then Clint Eastwood basically did it with Pale Rider. He remade the, uh, you yeah. know, so you do get a kind of a version of that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I would wholeheartedly recommend uh, you guys should check out, uh, I mean, just a great, great movie, uh, Shane. Um, yeah. It is very good. Yeah. So Sean, what was? Or just go watch. You can go watch Logan and get the like the the cheat sheet crib notes <laughs> from it. Technically, yeah. See Hugh Jackman, right? He's that's good casting. Uh, I right. believe yeah, that, that he has it, done yeah. shit, but you've see? seen they him do it. They literally watch Shane in that movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah they literally watch it. <laughs> yeah, and quote it at the end. Yeah. Well, what was new to you this year, Sean? Uh, the new to me this year was, uh, or the new to you, um, this is where I had to put Cobra Kai because it is, uh, a two, last time I had episodes of 2019. Uh, so mine's going to be Cobra Kai. Uh, I love this show. Um, I was, I was really late to watch this. The first season was on, uh, what YouTube Red or some shit like that, which does that even still exist? I don't know. Um, always looked good, but I was not going to like sign up for youtube whatever to watch this dumb show so i waited on it everything passed and then season two finally came to netflix and then my kid because my kid does karate convinced me to watch it with him and we slowly but surely made our way through the episodes and it's just really fun the best parts about it it's it's cliche in all the right ways which is really hard to pull off um the i mean the soundtrack is obviously great um, they do, uh, again, cliche, but the callback moments to the earlier series, they do them and they feel pretty good. Like, I'm, I think that's because we have, uh, I mean, the cast is also great. Uh, William Zabka, um, what's his name? Ralph uh, Macchio. Ralph Macchio. Yeah. Like they're all doing, who are executive producers on this show. So they're kind of handling it as well. Um, but like those, I think the characters are written really well. Um, I think William Zabka should win Emmys because I love, he's able to go like, like he's an asshole, but then he's, you know, he's funny too, but then he's having a heartfelt moment with that kid and he's got tears in his eyes. And if you can like, if you can get me to root for a character, like I want you, I want this dude to make the good decisions. I want him to have a good life and I just want him to choose to do the right thing because I want to see good things, ha- good things happen to him. And he pulls that off perfectly. Like, I want so much good stuff for this guy. Like, I'm rooting for him. <laughs> and sometimes he just makes, like, just slightly the wrong decision or he's trying to be a good guy and letting um, uh, the other guy's name. I'm forgetting names all left and right here. Um, <laughs> who's the other sensei? Oh, Martin Cove. The, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Fuck me, Reese, Crease, Reese, Crease, yeah, Jesus. John Crease, Jesus, yeah, Crease, Crease is in there. Which I mean, you know, uh, I, it's nice. There's even callbacks to like the smaller characters from the first Karate Kid, like his the kids in his gang and everything, and yeah. the, in, a, in, a, sh- in a surprising way, in a very surprising way. Like yeah. it's a, it's like a one-off episode where you're like, what? But like, you know, damn. What? but we're like, oh, okay. Like, um, I didn't expect to feel that much. Right? Like, yeah. I, it is surprisingly emotional show. Um, I also think that we're getting one of the best, uh, what I think is a believable villain arc for the Hawk character. Mm-hmm. I watch this show and I see him and I'm like, that's how you turn a timid kid into a bad guy. And I think they're doing it really well. <laughs> like, the, I really respect the writing on this show. Um, Jesus, what else did I have written down? Like, it's just, um, I mentioned it's, it's soapy as well. I like the adult conversations as well as the kid stuff. It is, um, like I said, it's very soapy. It reminds me of another show and we discussed this on a chat, the OC, which, uh, Holly informed us she had never seen before. So, uh, I decided to bring that 
conversation here so I could chastise you. Sure, and that's fair. T- tell you to go watch the OC. I mean, it's um, really shocking that you haven't seen it, honestly. I know. It really is. I've been told that, yeah. Because it started in the early aughts, so it's not like it was. It started, you know, way out of time for you, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened there. But Cobra Kai, <laughs> I think, um, uh, it's, it's really fun. It is cheesy, but my God, they do it in the best way. Uh, I'm surprised how much I like the show. Season three is coming out in like five days. Me mm-hmm. and the kid are very excited to watch it, so... Uh, uh, that's that's my new to you. That's uh, finally I caught up on it, and I'm, and I'm very glad it's here and coming back. So, Cobra Kai. Did it inspire uh, you to go? Oh, sorry. Oh no, uh, go ahead, go ahead. did it inspire you to go back and watch uh, any of the early uh, Karate Kid movies? Now, my kid, not so long ago, I mean, he's uh, a young child, so we went through all of the Karate Kid movies multiple times. I am caught up, okay. to say the least. Right. Oh, I do, I do love like. Um, the little the one storyline um, about Elizabeth Shue's character mm-hmm. Allie mm-hmm. like they keep building that throughout the season I'm like yeah. fuck we're getting Elizabeth Shue in this show this is gonna be yeah. awesome <laughs> like just to bring that stuff back like they're slowly working towards it like by season three we should be able to get her on at least a one time one day contract yeah. and get her on this show they're doing like, little things and they're doing them well and, I was gonna say, and like you were saying the way it's written it's believable like the fact that he looked her up on Facebook and it's like a little message here and there. It's like this is the shit that actually happens. Like, yeah, that's, that's the real stuff. I think, and I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, the way Johnny is written is mind blowing to me because I, I agree with you. I'm rooting for this guy. It's not often I watch a show that I'm like, I feel it in my bones. I'm like, I want this guy <laughs> to be happy. <laughs> yes, I just said character you'll want to be happy. Show. Yeah. It's so well written. I, I think it's fantastic. And um, I was very much debating on that being my new to me as well. But I had a feeling you were going to pick it, Sean, because I knew how much you loved it. Um, so my new to me is going to be Shit's Creek. Ah. I love Shit's Creek. And I just got into it within the last year, just in time for the series finale. Um, I, uh, I, I was told a few actually Colin when you and I worked together Aaron told me to watch this show so it's mm-hmm. been several years and at the time I was like I don't fucking trust Aaron's judgment and I'm not gonna watch that dumb show <laughs> he told me what it was about and I was like that sounds stupid so I ignored it for years and then people kept telling me how great it was and I kept seeing all these things about it but I finally watched it this year and that show was brilliant it's so funny and I mean You'll probably see most of the stuff that we're that I'm going to be talking about tonight is probably more lighthearted than than it is dark. I know we watch typically on the freak show we watch a lot of dark stuff. We watch a lot of horror, a lot of sci-fi, but this year was a it was a dark year. So I went to like all the lighthearted stuff I could. So I think that was also why I had a hard time like catching up on movies that did come out this year because so many of them were dark themed. I'm like I just can't do it. <laughs> So um, I watched a lot of comedy this year, and Schitt's Creek being one of my top, my top go-to shows that I rewatched a lot. Um, it was one of my comfort blankets, if you will. It's just it's so well written. Like there's a reason that it cleaned up at the Emmys this year. Everyone does such a great job in the show. Dan Levy and Eugene Levy together, writing team of the year, like the father-son team that we needed desperately because their comedic timing is just fantastic. Um, Catherine O'Hara can do no wrong. She's spectacular. And if you watch like behind the scenes stuff with these people and then see how they are with their characters, the life that they bring to their characters is just so spectacular. They are these ridiculous people, but they're also so charming and so warm. And I think that it's just so, it's so brilliant to see it, to see the character arcs unfold on the show. And I love the, I love the way it's written as far as content. There's a lot to do with um, acceptance, with sexuality and identity. And um, if you haven't watched it, Dan Levy plays a character that is pansexual. And the way they talk about it on the show is totally natural. And it doesn't bring the focus to that, which I love because I think so often like people are trying to make a statement with a, like, oh, the character like that. And in this case, it's just, normal they're normalizing it in a really wonderful way and i really appreciate that you just you love these characters so much and acceptance 
and love just seems like such a natural thing on this show. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate that on TV for sure. Um, so yeah, it's, just, it's just, it's what we need this year is that kind of content, just warm, loving content. And, um, yeah, I watch it all the time. I watch it constantly. So I highly recommend Schitt's Creek. If you have not gotten into it, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's good stuff. Michaela, what was new to you this year? My new to you is something I was super late to the party on is Ash versus Evil Dead. Oh. The Stars TV series. Oh. I was so afraid to watch it because I was like, where can they possibly go with this story? Is it just going to be sad seeing Bruce Campbell do this again? Is it just going to like feel like is there's no way it can be good, right? It was actually really good. The third <laughs> season sags a little bit um, because they do that classic like, oh, there's a secret daughter. And it's like, no, oh, okay, you're out of ideas. You're out of ideas. It's a good thing the show's ending because Secret Daughter is not a plot line I want to watch ever, mm. ever, in any media ever. Um, but the first two seasons were fucking wonderful. It is so gory and it moves so quick. It's such a like breakneck pace. The episodes are 23 minutes, which is absolutely perfect. I, but I'm, I'm shocked that like a premium cable network like that is not making them do 45 minute episodes. Uh, 23 minutes each season is like 10 to 12 episodes or something like that. It is like the perfect amount. It is so gross. It is so violent. It is so much nudity. And just like, it is, it is like, if it was a movie, it'd be an NC-17 for sure. It is, it, and it's relentless with that stuff. It never lets up. Um, the episodes are kind of serialized sometimes, even though there is like an overall kind of story. And the new characters fit in really well. And I really like them a lot. And I see why they do the convention circuit because they are super likable and they do fit in to this world really well. And it's there's so many things to love if you're a fan of the series because they revisit so many old things. And it's and they but they also expand on the universe in ways you didn't expect. Like in the second season, he goes back to his hometown and everyone in his hometown thinks that he murdered all his friends in the cabin and he's known as Ashy Slashy. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a great idea for a season. Like a, like it's Andy like Majors plays his dad. Yeah. The six million Lee dollars Majors is still alive. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's a great idea to have him revisit your hometown and see all the people you went to high school with, and they think he's a serial killer. Like, that's, that's amazing. Funny. Yeah. It's fucking incredible. And you know what the problem is, though? Stars. The problem is that this was on Stars. If this had been a Netflix original, Amazon Prime original, literally anything other than Stars, we might still be getting new seasons of it. But mm -hmm. no one has Stars. No one gives a fuck about having Stars. No one's ever going to have stars on purpose. Like, if you have no. it, you fell into it for free. <laughs> I have the same. Holly mentioned it earlier. I was like, on I stars. have it simply because that's what Seduced was on. But didn't you cancel uh, it, like, right after you were done watching it? No, I still have it. Oh, okay. Well, you're the one person that has a star subscription. I don't know how long I'll have it, but I still have it. Uh, and, like, the one thing I love about it is it really keeps the sense of humor in it that, that those movies have. And it feels natural. Like, I haven't laughed out loud at a TV show this year as much as I have this one. And it's it's weird because you wouldn't think of it as being, like, a light watch, but it really is. And it's it was a really good, like, shut off your brain and just kind of, like, have a good laugh and escape show. And, the, you know, there's this kind of running thread of, like, Bruce Campbell assumes every person he meets wants to fuck wants to fuck him, which normally that would annoy me because he's super old, but it's Bruce Campbell, so I believe it. Like, <laughs> oh, for sure, every person you meet wants to fuck you. You're Bruce Campbell. Like, not at all bothered by that. Like, it makes sense, and it makes sense for this character, you know? So definitely, if you, I'm sure all of our listeners have already watched the show, but maybe give it a rewatch if you haven't seen it for a while because it it's really good, and I hope it, like... It's something that other people continue to rediscover over time. Is it on Netflix now? Do we know? Or is it, it is still... all on Netflix right now, okay. all three seasons. Yeah. So that's how everyone, everyone is re like me is rediscovering it. Yeah, you might have convinced me on that one, Michaela. It sounds really yeah. horrible. Oh, it's. A, <laughs> I, like I mean, how... the first episode alone, Sam Raimi directed it, and I'm like, this is. You know, I could not. That was one of those nights when I sat there watching it on the premiere night where it was just like, you, you're not sure if you're dreaming or awake because you're like, am I actually seeing Evil Dead 4? You know, and they nailed right. it. I mean, they Bruce Campbell has that character down so well 
All you got to do is like, <laughs> you know, let him do his thing. And it's magic. Right. And when you see where his life is at, it totally makes sense. You're like, yeah, this is what would happen to him. Like, <laughs> this all tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, best new to you. So next up, what do we got? For number three, we have uh, what we're calling unexpected pleasure, which is basically your guilty pleasure. But around here at the Freak Show, we don't believe you should feel guilty about what you watch. So we're calling it unexpected pleasure. Very so, true. Colin, <laughs> Unless you watch the blood beat, then you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say unexpected pleasure because it was uh, the last movie that I saw that I really keyed in on, and it was called The Wolf of Snow Hollow. This is, uh, it's, man, I don't know how to describe it. So it's basically, there's Colin, a, there's a snowy gonna... town. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I'm going to, at a certain point, I'm going to jump in here with you. This was my next cat. This is my favorite of the year. Oh, okay. All right. So, it's so far, but you though, keep going. There's a wolf, maybe? Yeah. There's That's the a log line. Yeah. Because it's like, it's, if you imagine the town of Fargo, right? Only this is Utah. Snowy town, you know. And there's uh, this, uh, well, there's a sheriff who's like, I don't know. This, this guy, so it's Jim Cummings, I think, is the name of the uh, actor. Yes. Uh, director who made a movie called Thunder Road, where I think he played basically the same type of character. It won awards at a film festival, it's at like Sundance or whatever. I haven't seen it. I need to go back and check it out because now I'm like, mm -hmm. I got to see the other stuff that this guy does. Because right. the writing is like so, it's like that snappy, um, quippy, very clever, uh, you know, writing. And the actors are like pitch perfect. They, they just go it. with it. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got um, you've got Robert Forster, the late great Robert Forster. This is probably like his last uh, his screen role, I believe. Uh, you know, it was re released after he passed away, and yeah. because of the role that he plays in it, which is kind of uh, he's like the sheriff um, who's you know knows that his time is coming up, but it's also like for his entire generation. You know, and the way that guys like him think, it's like, you know, we know that the time is coming to an end. And so, like, his son is about to take over. And this guy has um, the son, Jim Cummings, has like a collection of personal crises all <laughs> closing in on him to make him this manic character who may you know like that that title may have a double meaning i think uh, <laughs> he may be also the wolf of absolutely but there is a literal like there's then they believe that uh, this these murders are the work of a werewolf what must yeah. make it what makes it funny though is like everybody else thinks it's a werewolf except for him and he's just <laughs> like there's no such thing as werewolves you know so that's his go through through the movie and it was really fun like i laughed out loud unexpectedly <laughs> You know, it's a lot so of funny, times... like especially when he's just he's yelling at people. Yeah, but he's ye but he's yelling at people for things you want to yell at people for. Where he's just like, just do your job. I'm in charge. Just do your job. And it's it's such a great delivery. And you, I, I relate to his anger in this movie because, like you said, Colin, he is having a collection of life crises at one moment, and it's pretty great. You know, I really liked that movie, and I really wanted it to be my best of the year, but I felt like it rushed the climax a little bit too much, and I wish it would have slowed down there and spent more time there, because that's what I was really invested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's also, I mean, like, I'm making it sound like, I don't know, did I make it sound like it was a comedy? Because it's fun and snappy and witty, but it really is like a, it does have elements of like a serial killer procedural. Yes. But like Fargo, right? So it's like it is, a serial yeah, it is. comic, you know? Yeah. But it is a horror movie, you know? It is, yes. I, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, I uh, was, uh, you know, like I said, I'm bringing this up now because in the past couple of months I've been watching a lot of stuff, and that one stood out as like a, uh, you know, like I keep thinking about it. I want to go back and see it again. So, Wolf of Snow Hollow for Unexpected Movie of the Year. Sean, you what's yours? My unexpected pleasure. Um, I have a pick and then a, a farewell, if you will. Uh, the pick is uh, Palm Springs. Um, I, did any of you guys watch this this year? I've been wanting to watch it because it sounds interesting, but I have it's, not made it there yet. I mean, it, this is it, unexpected pleasure. This is really it. Um, it is a romantic comedy filled with a little bit of time travel. 
Uh, it stars Andy Samberg and the mother. Can't Kristen Malati. Also, yep, her. Um, it stars those two, and it's it's a weird thing where they it's Groundhog Day, but in Palm Springs they get caught in a time loop. They have they spend time together. They have to figure out if you know just because they're stuck together, or, you know, and they do fall in love, or do do they not? Do they want to be together? It is. It may sound cliche, but it's so fucking charming. You can't help but just love like every part of it everyone's doing great nobody's overbearing nobody's like too much in this movie it, they, everyone plays it kind of perfect and it really is like um it, it's very sweet but it's also fucking hilarious um yeah if you guys haven't watched it like you, you really should watch this it's really great uh it was popular all over twitter and all that stuff but for a reason it's a really good movie um you know, it, it really, you know, it's kind of heartwarming and everything. It's just, and it's a nice treat for a movie. It was unexpected that it would be that good. So um, that's my unexpected pick. Uh, and there was also a farewell. Now, as the, uh, I'm not going to say self-appointed, because I'm pretty sure everybody appointed it to me, but as the arbiter of anything Tremors on this show, um, I do have to say that we did get a new Tremors movie this year, Tremors, Tremors Shrieker Island. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, uh, looking back, I've had a tenuous relationship with these movies. Uh, I think the first two are great. Everything after that is kind of... Are you of... breaking up with Tremors? Yes. Holly, oh. I'm breaking up with Tremors. Wow, you heard it here first, folks. Breaking news. <laughs> I thought, Holly, now, when I was thinking about doing this, I'm like, well, I could go that way. But I thought, I think I'm breaking up. Like, I think in my head, I'm done with this. Which is good, because the series is... <laughs> pretty much done um uh there is a there's a goodbye to a main character uh spoiler at this point if you don't want to hear anything about Trimmer of shrieker island skip ahead by about 30 seconds uh, three bert dies two ah. Whoa. <laughs> bert bert dies at the end of this movie the long-running main character of the tremor series uh gets eaten by a tremor and then exploded uh, by a graboid and then exploded at the end of this. So he's I'm shocked. Pr pretty much dead. Which I mean, I am shocked because I would have thought the seventh movie they would just keep on going. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I feel I must say like uh, uh, goodbye to Tremors in that it's ending, but also goodbye in that I don't. Oh, I haven't. I haven't cared about the series for a while. I couldn't even get through this whole movie. I watched it for the first 15 minutes by the first shit or the second shit joke. I was out. I couldn't do it anymore. Um, but then my brother told me how it ended. And I was like, what? They actually did something like permanent to a main character. And so I went back and watched like the last 15 minutes of the movie and a little bit uh, before that, I guess, as well. I may have watched most of this movie on accident. Um, <laughs> but what did I did you watch it all in one sitting? <laughs> no, he never not at does. All. I watched the first uh, beginning, the end. Then I went back to the middle to the end. Um, but what I want to say is that I know it's weird. It's weird. It's You're weird. It's weird. Man of mystery, Sean. I gotta tell you. I know. Wait. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All over the place. Because I didn't want to watch it, but then I was just looking for parts. Yeah. But uh, Bert does die, and they, at the end of the movie, it's it's a farewell to him. They uh, after he dies, there's. I'm surprised how well they pulled it off for a movie that shit. The goodbye to Bert is rather well done. I got a little teary-eyed. They do bury him, and then there's no words. They just leave his hat and his sunglasses on like a, a roughly hewn grave. Um, and there's a nice music swell, and it it goes to black it, right at the minute you thought it would. And it's just like, wow, they actually they did nothing else right. They said goodbye to this character very well. So I want to say they did that very well, but I also want to say goodbye to Tremors. May you rest in peace. Give us a good, like, 10 years before we try any of that shit again so <laughs> au revoir tremors tremors and uh yeah that's my unexpected for this i year. have i have to ask in the spirit of sean watching something for 15 minutes and then shutting it off in your research or whatever you want to call it for for this episode was there anything you tried and shut off within 15 to 20 minutes of the movie anyone else <sighs> no i committed to all the bad stuff i watched unfortunately did you yes wow i I'm going to need, like, at the end of this to ask our listeners to write in if they've seen some of the terrible shit I've seen, because I need someone to talk about it with yeah. and get through go. it. I, tr I tried watching, um, I'm thinking of ending things, and I shut it off after 15 minutes. So right. it fucking sucks. I was just curious if anyone else had one. 
Yeah, I'm trying. For to... some reason, I still have a shred of hope with movies that they'll turn it around. <laughs> I guess I don't know why, but I had that experience I... with a uh, recent. It's on Shutter. It's called The Pale Door. I warned everybody here off of it. I like could not make it through the whole <laughs> movie. That sucks because Damn. the premise is so cool. Yeah. And the poster is so cool. Yeah, but... What's the? I think I remember the poster. What's the premise? It's after a train robbery goes bad. The very fictionalized version of the Dalton gang has to hole up in a uh, uh, small western town where all the women, well, I don't know, they have a secret. It's a horror movie, and, you know, yeah. Okay. But, so they man, eat men, is what you're saying. Cheap, cheap, cheap movie, and, yeah. Oof. Well, alrighty then. Uh, Holly, I think you're next. Um, yes. Your unexpected pleasure so, of 2020. This one was difficult for me, because the one I landed on technically the most recent season came out in 2019 and it's a show rule breakers i know i know, I know. Well, but this is unexpected pleasure it can be from any time True. right that's what i was it thinking, doesn't have right? to be recent True. that's what i was thinking um and i was not expecting to like this show because my parents recommended it to me and that's usually a sign that i'm gonna hate it um but i really love the show dairy girls i don't know if anyone else watches this show uh... It is fucking hilarious. My favorite I, murder talks of it often. They, it's they so really love funny. it. It's so funny. Um, you may have to watch it with closed captioning on um, because they have very strong Irish accents and sometimes it's difficult to understand them. But it's um, it's about a group of girls in the early 1990s. Um, they're about 16 years old. They go to like Catholic girl school. Um, and it is just so goddamn funny. I can't even... It's during the time of like the IRA. So there's, you know, I Ireland is under threat constantly. Like their school bus is always getting pulled over for bomb checks. And what makes it so funny is that these girls could not care less about the problems of the world. They just care about what's happening to them. And it's so relatable right now because I think we're all doing that. We're trying to look for like the little things in our own lives because what's happening in the rest of the world is just too much right now. So I get it. Like they'll be sitting there on the bus and the, like, there's, you know, armed men coming on their bus looking for a bomb and they're all like, Oh, how long does it fucking take to look for a bomb? Like they're just so put off by it. It's so funny. And that's like the, that's the feeling of the entire show. It's just the stuff that shouldn't matter is what matters to them. And it's just very refreshing comedy. It's, it's vulgar as hell. Like they're 16 year old Irish girl. So it's vulgar as all fuck. And it's, it's just genius comedy. I can't even really, I can't even really put into words. Like it's, it's very lighthearted and it's just what I needed this year. I don't know. It's so enjoyable. Um, you know, part of me really wanted to talk about how much I love the British baking show, but I didn't think anyone would want to listen to that. So, <laughs> dairy girls. Um, but there was a spectacular moment in my life when I discovered that there was a holiday episode of the Great British Baking Show featuring the cast of the Dairy Girls. <laughs> and my whole world came together in this beautiful harmony and the world smiled upon me in that moment. So Dairy Girls slash Great British Baking Show. Wow. Pleasure of the year, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Michaela, what was your unexpected pleasure? Well, I know I've talked about this movie on the Freak Show before. I would love to bring it to the freak show one day, but I do not think it's appropriate. So I will not. So I'll use this opportunity to talk about it. Yes. Uh, my pick is a little movie from 1984 called rhinestone. Oh. This is uh, oh. Dolly Parton and Sylvester Stallone in a comedy two hander uh, directed by Bob Clark, believe it or not. This was his follow up after a Christmas story. <laughs> um, oh. So Dolly Parton is a country singer and she has a residency at the world's biggest honky tonk and which is in New York city, by the way, in this movie, uh, you know, famous for country music, New York. City. Sure. Um, <laughs> and she has a bet that she can't turn Stallone, who is a New York city cab driver into a country star. And it's wild, man. Stallone thinks he's a comedian and it's more just, he's unintentionally funny um she brings him home to tennessee and he learns how to be like country because you gotta like live the life to sing the music and it's wild man it it's Wait. unlike any movie i've ever seen i feel like movies like this don't get made anymore and if they do it's like it's like ironically whereas like this movie has like a sincerity to it you know 
Um, like, I feel like if they made this movie now, it'd be like with Melissa McCarthy and it'd be like, you it'd know, be mean spirited. You know, I was just, I was just going to say like the closest thing I can think of. And it all, like, I almost made it my worst of the year movie was Eurovision. It's the uh, shit like that is what's yeah. getting made now instead of Rhinestone. Yeah. I don't feel like movies like this get made that are just sincere and just like for the fun of it, it has to be ironic or has to have like sarcasm to it or it just, it can't just be like a cheesy, you know, rom-com just yeah. for the sake of it. Why can't we have movies like Big Business? Out right, nowadays? exactly. Like why? <laughs> right. And this is, by, this is by no means Dolly Parton's greatest movie or anything, but I mean, she's always a treat to watch and always, uh, I mean, she's a real life saint. So, you know, she is. Um, unfortunately, this movie is like not available anywhere. Like, Holly and I were talking about it and I checked just watch and it was like nothing came up and I was like oh my god I need to keep the gospel of rhinestone alive because <laughs> no one can discover it anymore and uh no. thankfully I own a dvd copy so I'm good but <laughs> no but no special no special edition blu-rays out there no no just just dvd and like it is I'll have to send you guys a picture I sent Holly a picture of it like from my shelf but it's like it's like um Dolly Parton and Stallone like hard style like holding hands across the top it's it's incredible um I mean you get Stallone wearing like a hat with like eight coontails on it singing a song he wrote called right. Drinkenstein yeah we've um, seen the clip yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's a trip man it's it is a gem lost to time and I I will keep the gospel of rhinestone alive I think it's something everyone should check out just for like the time capsule effect if nothing else Especially like the first time I watched it, I was kind of blown away when I realized that Dolly Parton and Stallone are the exact same age. Oh wow! Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, no. so, yeah. Exactly. That was my reaction. Oh wow! <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that is my unexpected pleasure. Like I said, we don't believe in guilty pleasures here. Like what That's you like, enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy Ryan Stone, so I would definitely recommend you all check it out. Well, that one's on my, my bucket list. Yeah, I gotta, <laughs> when the COVID's over, you got to loan me that uh, yeah. DVD. Why yeah. aren't you buying 16 millimeter prints of rhinestone <laughs> on eBay, Colin? Yeah, when when they become available, Sean. There you okay. go. Okay. All right. Uh, unexpected or guilty pleasure. Next up, what are we getting? It Your is our best year. slash favorite of the year. Okay. Uh, mine's like a obvious choice. Uh, you know, I looked back over everything that I saw this year and I think the movie that I enjoyed the most was probably the last movie that I saw in a movie theater and it was called the invisible man. This is uh, okay. universal. I thought you were going to say tenant and I was about to reach this screen oh, and you're right. slap you. I did see tenant in the theater. You are correct. I, uh, yeah. yes. Um, Oof. Uh, I'm, I'm half and half on tenant. I didn't think it was horrible, but uh, I don't think it's horrible either. Yeah. But I, I have problems with oh, yeah. things. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Maybe we should have an airing of grievances segment at the end <laughs> where we can talk about all that other stuff <laughs> right? not on our list. Well, we do I have. Know, I think we do I have a segment. Five coming up. is going to get us all talking. Yeah. Um, but the Invisible Man. So this is uh, Lee Winnell, who, um, you know, I mean, this guy started out with, uh, writing the Saw movies for uh, uh, James Wan. He did. He wrote the first three, right? He wrote a movie that I like that many people don't uh, seem to appreciate called Dead Silence. It's one of those creepy puppet movies. Uh, he wrote uh, Death Sentence, too similar of a title, which is basically a, a Death Wish remake with uh kevin bacon in it and he directed um a movie or he, and he wrote the insidious movies and he's in the insidious movies and he uh cool. directed a movie he became a director uh with a movie called upgrade which if you haven't seen it you should check it out because this came out the same year i think as venom and it's basically venom only with an ai instead of a symbiote thing and that was really cool and then the next step up then was he did the Invisible Man when Universal was trying to bring back, uh, you know, they're still trying to bring back all the classic monster movies. But the thing that I liked about this, and generally it's a Blumhouse movie, and generally I don't like it when Blumhouse buy or gets the title to a movie and then throws out the movie and then comes up with a different movie and calls it, you know, Black Christmas or Fantasy yeah, Island. Yeah, stay or... tuned for later in this list. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So generally, I'm opposed to the practice. However, the, this, I thought, was a fresh take on The Invisible Man. Obviously, we've seen The Hollow Man, and we've seen Memoirs of an Invisible Man, and other, you know, The Man Who Wasn't There. 
with Steve Gutenberg. That's right. I'm the only person who's ever seen that movie. No, no, you're not. You oh. know I love the Goots. <laughs> in, I, I've seen it in 3D. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> that was Wait, one of... if they're invisible, <laughs> you saw what in 3D? Yeah, you nah. see the shorts running around and him doing it. Yeah. It was, uh, um, but the angle that this movie took was instead of, uh, you know, because I think the whole idea of invisibility is you get to live vicariously through the idea. You know, they always go through a checklist, the writers do, of the stuff that, you know, you want to do when you're invisible or what would it be like to be invisible or whatever. Right. Girls locker room is always like. Right. In right. The right. Top that five kind usually. of shit. But this one uh, had the idea to like, let's put this in the perspective of the person who's being victimized by the invisible assailant and by doing that they created a total new uh dynamic that was extremely tense uh the use i mean just of negative space where you know it's like you know the camera would be on uh elizabeth moss and then turn down a hallway you're shooting nothing but we're sitting there going like is the invisible man in the frame right now? And you're studying the frame, trying to see if he's there. I thought all that stuff was great. Very assured, strong direction. Uh, the movie costs like $7 million, but it feels like it costs more than that because they end up being able to pull off all the stuff that, you know, was, uh, you know, very uh, technically savvy for a low budget movie. And I got to give like massive props to Elizabeth Moss. I think this is the best performance that I saw of the year. And the reason I say that is because her character is uh, she's got to be in a state of um, agitation, anxiety, fear, panic, right? Like basically the entire way through the movie and they shoot these things out of sequence we know. And, you know, to, to be able to, to calibrate, an arc of you know uh apprehension uh and be able to tell where you are when i'm shooting this on thursday but i'm supposed to do the thing that i did before this on friday and you know yeah um, she had to gauge yeah. what level of crazy she was at that day yes and she gets to some yeah. high levels of crazy too like her yeah. yeah her eyes and her is doing a lot of acting in this movie she does very well yeah i mean i thought you know again i haven't seen the more oscar bait movies I haven't seen the movie. What is it called? First Cow. First, yeah, that's on everybody's list. I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> that was on the New York Times or whatever. It's like yeah. the, the harbinger of the Oscar. First Cow, and like, okay. Uh, but you, <laughs> the freak show listener, the Invisible Man, I think is if this is the new direction that they're going to pursue with these uh, remakes of the Universal Monster movies, and there are several more in the pipeline. It's like, if this is the direction they're going, then color me, uh, you know, I'm buying a ticket. I, I, I'm in that seat. I'm going to be signing up to watch this. I think this was the best movie that uh, I saw this year. Um, yeah. So, Sean, what was your best or slash favorite movie of the year? Uh, let me say, very nice, Colin. The Invisible Man's in my top five of the year somewhere. It's a very, It was a very good movie. Are we doing and honorable was, mentions? Just, we can. Why not? Well, I think at the end of everything, we'll be go. We'll go like, I hey, also this. Also, I have grievances with Tenet. Yeah, it's just gonna be a lot of Tenet bashing at the end of the show, everybody. So just wait for that. Um. Uh, oh yeah, like I said earlier, um, my favorite of the year was Wolf of Snow Hollow. Um, I really dug this movie. Um, the it has kind of an acidic humor, a wit to it that I really liked. Um. It also feels like a very angry movie, and um, like, uh, and I don't know how that comes across. The you know the main character, like we said, is going through many things in this movie, and he gets very frustrated and angry at sometimes. And it's very funny. It is also like it's a horror movie, and there are some genuinely like freaky parts to this. Like, uh, have we all seen it? Have you guys all seen it? I've seen it. Yeah, I think Holly's the only one who hasn't. Okay. Right. Well, uh, I'll just say there's a moment later on where. Um, there's a there's a, a conversation in a doorway and there's a change in one character that really works well in that moment and it's and it 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 rides that line to the entire movie and it has those moments throughout it which I thought they pulled off really well. Um so they they ride a good line between horror and comedy, um, but it's done extremely well. Um I liked and it, you know, it is kind of also a heavier movie. Like it's got its heavier moments in it too. Um, which become a little like real at certain points and just like, whoa, 
Um, so they're, uh, they do a lot in that movie and I really liked it. And I mean, and, uh, and kind of the, maybe the questions you're left with at the end are like, you know, I think they're good questions. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that movie. So again, uh, Wolf of Snow Hollow was my I will say I found Jim Cummings year. very charming. He's very charming. I like him. Like Colin said, I, I want to really go find like the other shit he's done because mm-hmm. I will like watching him like interact and do all this stuff. So yeah, he's one of I those think guys. He did real well. You know, it's like every once in a while you you see a movie or something. And, I mean, because I think he was writer, director, and star, right? Which, that's a fucking yep. that's a heavy load to pull off yeah. a movie as accomplished as that is. And he's but he's one of those guys that you go like. I want to see what this guy does next. Yes. Right. Yep. Sean, like like you were saying that that conversation in the doorway when he delivers that line of, hey, can you blank blank for me? Yeah. Like the way he just says it is so throwaway. But like as the viewer, you know, like the weight that line carries. And yeah. that was when I was really sold on him. Yeah. It reminded me of this, a moment in good. Zodiac. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the best moments like that. And again, the other characters there, his change is like. It's done very well. You knew it was there and you knew it was coming, but the change convinced me. And yeah, it was good. Yeah. And all hail Robert Forster. Uh, yeah. That was just yeah. a great part. Yeah. That's a great part for yeah. him. That's kind of like the perfect way to go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Holly. Yeah. All three of you have convinced me to watch that movie. I'm definitely going to watch it this week. Yeah. I think you it, would yeah. like a lot about it, but I think you might have some of the same issues I have with it. But overall, you would still really enjoy it. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to watch that this week. Um, so like Colin, I very much enjoyed Invisible Man, and that was definitely in my top. Um, but I knew Colin was going to pick it, so I was in search of what can top Invisible Man. I don't know if it'll top, if it'll top it, but it's a movie that I really felt when I watched it, and it's a movie called Alone Ooh, by okay. John Hyams. I don't know if any – I know Michaela watched it. Um, I don't think I can ever watch it again, honestly. (laughs) Yeah, this movie is pretty much pure anxiety. Like, it it really is. That It's considered a thriller. Um, As a woman, it's a horror to me. It's definitely a horror movie for me. Um, It is about a woman. She's recently a widow, and she's traveling across country, just, like, move somewhere and start a new life. And on her journey... She is stalked by a man and then abducted by him. And I'm not giving anything away by that. Um, And I won't tell you spoilers, but um, it is, it's not groundbreaking as far as a premise, but the way it is, the the way it is done is just horror. It's horrific. This movie is terrifying. From the littlest details, when she's um, when she's driving at the beginning, she, when she's driving across country, just the little things like her noticing the car in her rearview mirror that's following her too long and then too closely, it's something that I think we all do. We all have these like little moments that we're observing something like, is this in my imagination? Am I seeing this? It's very dual. It's very Spielberg dual. Um, so it's that like. I'm imagining this. There's no way this car is actually following me. And then the moment she realizes that it is like, it's, it really gets you. And then it gets worse when she's like, she's at a gas station and she's on the phone. And again, like this is, you know, female perspective. I do this too. When you, when it's nighttime and you're alone somewhere, you are looking at every single person and being observant for everything around you. And not all movies really get that, but this got it. Like you understand that she is on high alert for very obvious reasons. She's a woman, she's by herself, and she's already had this weird close call with a car. And every moment is like that leading up to like the actual like kidnapping. And it is, it's very fluid. It's very natural. It, the way it's shot is it, it's, it's really, it's really a beautiful movie. It takes place like in a very heavily wooded area, um, you know, from a cabin and like, most of the movie is shot in the woods and it's a beautifully shot movie. Um, But really the tension never goes away. You have anxiety the entire movie. And it's not often that I see a movie that I feel that. And it's not often that I see a movie that I'm okay with that. There are great payoffs to that feeling in this movie. And it's, it just really impacted me. Like it, it really did affect me. And I did, I didn't feel that about a lot of movies this year. So this one really left um this one really left it, it's it's uh it's imprint on me so i would recommend it i i've read a few reviews online and there was a lot of really bad reviews 
I don't know. I don't want to say they were probably all men. I don't know. But I have a feeling a lot of them might have been. Um, a lot of them were like, oh, I've seen this story before. It's like, well, maybe, but we've seen a lot of stories done before. It doesn't mean it wasn't done better. Like, I don't know. Um, so I recommend it. It really left an imprint on me. So alone for sure. I don't know, Michaela, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. I mean, I, it's a really simple concept, but it's really well executed and it's yeah. brutal at times and really hard to watch at certain times. And I just, we got 15 minutes into it. My husband was like, I really don't think you should be watching this. He was like, you're already <laughs> so paranoid. This is going to happen to you. And this is just gonna make you feel worse. And oh, I was no. like, you're probably right, but <laughs> I, I don't shut off movies really. And I was like, well, Holly yeah. recommended it. So like, you know, and I was like, and she watched it at home actually alone. Like, <laughs> so, um, I was very pleasantly surprised with it. I, I thought the choices the characters made were logical and realistic. There was no point in the movie where I was like, well, that wouldn't happen that way. Like it, right. it really, and then I was also kind of like cataloging some of it. Like, Hey, if I ever get in the situation, I should remember <laughs> to try that. Like, right. Yeah. Um, sure. I'm kind of like, frustrated that people would criticize this movie because I don't know what more you would want from it you know right I think so too absolutely um Who, who's the actress in it oh god what is her name um let me look I it up don't remember her name there was two people that I was not familiar with so there's a, really only three actors in this movie right it's very, and it's... as far as like yeah there's only three actors and honestly the dialogue is pretty minimal as well but it but it's in the Pacific mean, Northwest. You're getting these beautiful mountains and yeah. woods this whole time. And are and there like, overhead drone shots of woods? There's a little, at the beginning. There's a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's always at the beginning. You know, there's uh, very like Ted Bundy methods of trapping people in this movie. Yeah, you it's know, Jules a lot of cast in my car broke down type stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jules Wilcox is the actress. Yeah, and it doesn't look like yeah. she's done much else that we would recognize. But okay, yeah, all right. So I'm yeah. curious. I was I was also I was very much considering talking about um uh, the vast of night which I really enjoyed. Best um, tracking talk best single shot of the year. Hands down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> best oneer, that sorry, that's what we're called, the oneer. Best oneer of the year. It was it was very uh, I I recommend checking that out. It's an interesting movie. It's it's different. Like it it's very unique. So, I recommend that as well, but alone is my top. So, Michaela you know, I watched a lot of stuff this year in preparation. And I found a lot of it of it to be very middling. Um, I, I it was really hard for me to be blown away by anything I watched this year. I felt like, uh, and obviously there's like extenuating circumstances to that. Um, but like last year, 20 minutes into Doctor Sleep, I knew that was my number one of the year, and I just could feel myself falling in love with that movie. The longer I went, spent time with it. I didn't have that feeling at all this year, which I mean, like I <laughs> so said. So Michaela's like, it's the Mandalorian again. No, <laughs> no, I have a legit movie. I did my homework. I've been watching like two movies a night for like three weeks now, trying to find one that I can find a Dr. Sleep love again. But that was a once in a lifetime love that'll never happen again. <laughs> um, so I was kind of on the fence between two movies with this, but to me, it's going to come down to ending and whether or not it's based on an existing intellectual property. And so I'm going to go with Hunter Hunter, mm. which is uh, an IFC Midnight movie that came out this year. And I think it was last year that the Clovich Killer came out, and I had that on my list as well. So I think IFC Midnight has really cornered something I like about this kind of like intersection between true crime and horror. Mm. And Hunter Hunter is this fucking bleak, kind of depressing movie about Devin Sawa and his <laughs> wife and his daughter that are fur trappers right. that live in the country like in isolation in a shack basically and they find out that they have a wolf that has like discovered their traps and it's kind of not afraid of people because it knows they can come eat from these traps all the time so they're terrified of that and they're trying to deal with that he's constantly smoking filtered cigarettes which if you're poor maybe don't do that you save a lot of money <laughs> if you would stop smoking filtered cigarettes um but it's Man, I thought I had this movie figured out. I thought I was two steps ahead of it, and then the ending happened, and I was could not have been more wrong. It had one of the most shocking, chilling endings I've seen in quite a while, and I've been thinking about it ever since I watched it because I'm trying to find a flaw in how it doesn't add up, but it does, and I'm like, damn, that movie is so much smarter than people are probably giving it credit for, and no one's talking about it. Like People talked about it for the first few days after it came out, and yeah. now, I mean... I really don't let anyone spoil the ending for you because 
What's it on? I I got watched it on Amazon, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's it. a, it's so. a rental right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm gonna have to check this out. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, I'd recommend it. I saw it uh, like just the other night. Yeah, it has great performances. Um, like it's a lot of like, f- like you know, a shack lit by like an oil lamp kind of you know mm-hmm. photography. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the way the separate plot lines kind of all tangle together at the end. Like I said, I thought I knew what it was going to be. And if it was what I thought it was going to be, I was going to be really happy because I'm like, fuck yeah, this would be an awesome way to go. And I was so wrong, but I was still so happy with being wrong. And okay. I, I, like I said, it's, it's not based on an existing intellectual property, which I feel like everything I've watched this year has been. So that really put over the top for me, the ending and just being an original story. IFC Midnight is doing good work. But then at the same time, they're also putting out movies like The Rental, which listeners, if you have seen that, please write in because I need to have a therapy session about how bad that movie was. But um, <laughs> Hunter Hunter, I definitely recommend you guys all watch it. I think that for me, what really works about it, too, is that it has this kind of through line like Sweetheart, one of my picks from last year, that like hell is other people is kind of the thesis. And that's something I always appreciate in a horror movie. Like, there's even a part where Devin Sawa's wife is like, well, you're just afraid of people and that's your problem. And I'm like, well, that's a valid fear. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get I get where he's coming from with that. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend Hunter Hunter. I, I'm still thinking about it. I really hope you guys all watch it so we can all freely talk about it. It's a great movie. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to watch that tonight. I'm like adding it to my queue right now. It yeah. employs a bunch of um, like um, multiple perspectives throughout the movie too, which uh, you know it's like that was just an interesting uh, you know a narrative choice. Yeah, yeah Colin, a- is there anything you wanted to add since you, especially since it's fresh for you? It's been about a week and a half since I watched it. I think. Don't add too much, Colin. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't want to tell you too much. Uh, obviously, <laughs> more than. I'm always what... afraid that Colin's going to spoil yeah. everything. No, no, I went with what I'm going with what Michaela has told you, but. Uh, okay. <laughs> It's just, uh, you know, it's it's interesting um, because it's a it's a it's it's showing you a lifestyle that's just I don't know I don't want to say bizarre but like it's a singular choice Boring? right yeah they are choosing to leave civilization behind and live off the land you know and so it's basically I think you know they're raising their daughter to do this so she's you know going to be able to you know hunt trap and you know live off the land and it's uh it was just a it was a really interesting family dynamic and as the movie goes on it's like those characters uh the the actors there i think again deserve a special uh mention because uh everybody was uniformly uh very good very good how do you feel about the photography colin since there was a lot of like warm like you know like oil lamp shots and like foresty stuff yeah i mean it has it has a solid atmosphere it is no night claws uh it was shot in the woods but it actually uh you know it gives you that kind of you know michaela said bleak i think bleak is kind of a good you know uh cold uh you know uh fall um you know atmosphere to it and uh yeah it just it's a survival story i guess maybe that's it. it's a survivalist movie you know it's a tale of survival so yeah hunter hunter also shocked to see Nick Stahl in a movie in 2020. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. like, oh, shit. I was like, at first I was like, that's not him. Eh, no. John, I was like, what John Connor missing? himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, the yellow bastard yeah, returns. That yellow bastard. Yeah. That yellow bastard. Okay. So that was right, the, the best movie of the year. Um, I guess now it's time to turn this. All our around. favorite category. Yeah, our favorite category Buckle every year. Buckle up for the longest one. Yeah. The airing of grievances is about to begin. So what are we in for, Michaela? This is our uh, worst slash most disappointing of the year. So. All right, well, I'm going Here with... Here are your grievances. Uh, I'm going with worst of the year. And uh, these two are, I think, two of among the uh, the first two movies that I saw this year. So I've harbored a grudge... For a long time against The Grudge is Ah. number one. I know nobody else saw it, right? But I I went out and saw The Grudge because there was uh, like a a marketing effort toward this. And it's like, oh, we're getting another Grudge. Is it a, it's called The Grudge. Does that mean it's a remake? Is it a sequel? I forgot that came out. Yeah. Yeah. So that feels like it was years ago, honestly. Years. Yeah. Well, you haven't, if you haven't seen it, you're not missing anything. It's easily one of the worst movies of the year. It's just a, um, 
it is it's like an american set version of the japanese film the grudge which had a american remake which was at least set in japan this is like the grudge america and i don't have any kind of fault against like the people who are in it andrea reisenberg from uh, uh mandy is in it damien bashir is in it uh it's one of it's got to be like one of the last kiss off performances of lynn shea who you had to have in every single ever since insidious right lynn shea is the patron saint of the modern horror era um it, the movie made no sense uh it was uh it's told in a disjointed uh narrative the same way that the original films are but it's just like what are we doing here what's the point how are we advancing this at all because yeah it is you know a backdoor sequel to the uh, other movies that you saw but it was extremely disappointing i sat there uh i numbed my ass for an hour and a half or whatever the hell it was and uh just there's the pull quote for the dvd colin (laughs) yeah an an ass-numbing movie the grudge um shit all over my fond memories of the original films because the original jew on the grudge i think i saw way before the american remake came out and was a big fan of it because that prior to insidious was like the scare a moment like i jumped like i don't jump in movies a lot right no you don't that movie made me jump like repeatedly to the point where you're like, oh, how is this guy doing it? I don't know. This is amazing. Like I'm actually getting the holy shit. Um, and that was a little less successful in the remake. They were all directed by uh, um, Shimizu Takashi. Uh, and uh, but this one is an American version and uh, sucked all over the place. And uh, you shouldn't watch it. The tie for that. I think maybe some of you saw it. Wait, did we go see this? I can't even remember. So it's 500 years ago. Uh, and that would be Brahms, The Boy 2, because <laughs> uh, we watched The Boy on the Saturday Night Freak Show at the beginning of this year, and because there was a sequel coming out. And so, okay, dutiful horror fan, I went to see it, and um, it retroactively ruined the first movie. The ads tell you things about the first movie that you shouldn't know, right? So it, it ruined the movie in the ads. And then yeah. it takes it to, because you're like, once you see the first movie, you're like, well, that's that's the story. There, there is really nowhere else to go with that until you see the boy, the Brahms two, or Brahms the boy two, where they just completely shit all over that with some fucking crazy, uh, you know. Say I can't in case you do watch it. I don't want to. You can it. no. You can no. spoil the shit out of it. No, I'm not <laughs> gonna do it. Uh, my kid's but, gonna make me watch it at some point oh god it is just uh, a terrible 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 <laughs> movie uh that i wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy so there you go those are the worst two movies of the year uh the grudge and brahms the boy too and everybody out there Oof. who's listening to this is like well yeah colin that's why i didn't watch that. obviously obviously yeah. all right sean worst of the year my worst of the year. I think this opens the can of worms for the end of the episode. I'm pretty sure if I know my fellow freaks as well as I think I do. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, mine was The Craft Legacy. That's mine too. Holly? No, because I knew Michaela was picking it. Ah, okay. And I haven't well, seen it. So no spoilers because I plan to watch what? it tomorrow. No, I'm not. Uh, you guys are going to warn me off of it. It's worst of the year. Okay. It... I don't know where to start with this movie. It is. Do you want me to do mine first so you guys can end us? Yes. Sure. Yeah, that works. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you go. Yeah, Sean, like... and then I'll kick it off and you can jump in All when right. you feel necessary. All right. Yes. Let's, do, let's do that. Because I, yeah, I hated, the, I hated the craft, but I knew someone else was picking it. I was like, okay, so I'm not going to go with worst. I'm going to go with biggest disappointment. So my biggest disappointment was Bly Manor. Uh... I. I love The Haunting of Hill House with a passion. I have rewatched that so many times. Just this year, I think I've rewatched it like six times. I'm not kidding. I rewatch it a lot. I love Hill House. So I was really, really, really excited for Bly Manor. Probably more excited for that than anything else that was scheduled to come out this year. And I, I was so disappointed in that it was the biggest bore fest. I mean, everyone's a lot of people's biggest complaint was it's not a horror show and that it's a love story, which I agree with. It's not a, it's not a horror show. Um, 
I guess it is a love story, but I, I don't even want to call it that because a love story can still be more substantial and more entertaining. This, I, I can't even really explain. It was just so boring. Like the, yes, there's some good bits. There's, there's a couple creepy parts. There's some, there's some decent, I mean, there's good acting in it. There's, there's some good characters, not everyone, um, but there's a couple of good characters that I really enjoyed watching, but for an entire series, it's just, there's not enough there. The, the story, there's not even enough story there. It just drags and it doesn't go anywhere interesting. I was just monumentally disappointed in this, in this show. Um, yes, it has good atmosphere. I will give you that. It's, it's a very creepy English mansion. You know, I love that. That's great, but it's not <laughs> enough for an entire show. Like the Hill House, I couldn't, I was at the edge of my seat the entire show. Like every part of that show, I was eating it up. This, I was like waiting for it to start the entire time. You know, like, I'm like, okay, well, when's the good stuff going to happen? When's the twist going to happen? Like something, give me something. And there's really no true substance to this show. It's, it's not the worst thing I've seen, but it's nothing memorable. And it's, it's nothing worth watching an entire show for. So I was, I was very disappointed in Bly Manor. Um, and that's to say a lot, cause I had, I was really disappointed by, um, um, Oh fuck! Now I forgot the name of it. The the devil all the time. Oh. I was very disappointed by that movie because I read right. the book, and I, the cast. I was so excited for that, um, but I think Bly Manor let me down a little bit more. So unfortunately, again, not the worst show, but it's not entertaining. There's really no nothing about it that I would be like, yeah, you should check it out for this. There's really nothing that I'd tell you to check it out for. So my biggest disappointment, unfortunately, was Bly Manor. So sad. Um, Mike Flanagan should have maybe had his hands on it a little bit more. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, because he only, I think, directed the first uh, episode, correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, that explains And it. he did a lot of the writing on Hill House, too. I think every did, episode. Yeah. yeah and directed every do, episode. Like, any on this, I don't think. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, he, he probably should have had his hands on this a little more, unfortunately. Well, it did not have that that Mike Flanagan goodness that I usually love. I mean, it's shot, it shot nicely. I mean, it, you know, it yeah, does have that kind of crisp, great. clean look that the original one had. But this is, yeah. um, did you ever see, so the, the story of The Haunting of Blind Manor is actually based on uh, The Turn of the Screw, right? Yeah. The Henry James classic story um, that they made into a movie in 1966 with uh, Deborah Carr. It was called The Innocents. Now, have yeah. you seen that one? I have. Did you like that one? That was a shrug. <laughs> she shrugged. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm going to go to bat for the innocence is like one of the next to the haunting. That's the two greatest uh, 60s uh, like supernatural films. And then they did a movie. Uh, Marlon Brando was in a movie called The Nightcomers, which tells yeah. like a prequel story in the 70s, which I haven't seen. Um, but I, have. I went on a Marlon Brando kick for a while. <laughs> is The Nightcomers any good? He mm, plays Peter Quint. What's that? Innocence is better. Okay. But just the, uh, I mean, because I also was disappointed by it for the same, because it employs a lot of the same, char uh, not characters, but actors from Haunting yeah. of Hill House, a lot of the same production team, a lot of the actors are doing very good work, but it's just, it feels like the story in this one, even though both of those are expansions of the original novels, right? I mean, the Haunting of Hill House is nothing like uh, Shirley Jackson's story. Right. Um, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, because the, they found a way to get into it, you know, and actually, like, get into each one of these characters and build something. And Haunting a Bly Manor tries to do that, but you you feel the weight of it. It's like the, the undercarriage here cannot support uh, all this crap that you're putting on top of it. This is a slim yeah. tale. So, yeah. 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 I, would, I would also warn you against the Haunting of Bly Manor. Unfortunately, yeah. That's this brings so this brings us to Sean and Michaela for a mutual hatred. Michaela, <laughs> yeah. you ready to double team this thing? Yeah, I'm really glad you watched it, Sean, because I knew you would have like all the same problems Holly and I had with it. 
And Holly what? and I, we actually watched it together, and I paid the stupid twenty dollars fee to rent this oh, piece of man. shit. Oh man, I'm sorry. I I'm was totally so gonna sorry. give you cash, and I forgot. It's okay. I didn't realize it was twenty dollars until afterwards, because you know you're just on Amazon. You're like, sure, I'll rent it, whatever. Right. Like, didn't think it was still twenty dollars two months after it came out. You know, it's not worth the two dollars I paid to rent it from the red box. Well, like and like Sean, I think we should get something out of the way at the top too. Is that I'm sure there's a number of the like people that are aware of this movie that think, well, it's not for you, right? Well, here's the thing. It's a sequel to a movie I love, so it is for me. Yeah. Right? Like, like isn't a sequel for people who loved the original? Right. So is it is that, for me. Yeah. Like, you try and draw in new people with a new movie, obviously, but you I mean, you were literally calling it the craft legacy. Now, and then the way the end pointing. ties it to the original, the ending. And let's, like, and let's, oh. ask, and let's ask the obvious question. Who's it for, then? Exactly. Like, especially with the way it starts with that Alanis Morissette song, I was like, okay, this is for me then. This is my right. generation's movie then. Like, right. it, it's just it, it's, a you, deeply... see, we, you sigh a lot while yeah. discussing this movie. Like, it's just yeah. natural to be like, why? Why, what, well, because... why would they do that? It's not, it, <laughs> I was going to say, it's not, the, the writing is, I think, horrible. I think it's yeah, absolutely it's horrible. Bad. It's lazy. It's so bad. The, uh, the editing is also horrible. Like, yeah. noticeably... Usually you can get away with the movie. Movie can be bad and the editing can be fine. This is noticeably bad editing at certain mm-hmm. points. Um, it's it, deeply it's... flawed on a fundamental level. Like, if you take the craft out off the title and just make this, like, a generic witch movie, it still doesn't work. Like, it just no. doesn't work as a basic movie. No. And it's also, like, they're trying... <sighs> There's no... Um, they're, they're not patient with this movie at all. This movie is in a rush... The movie is in a rush to make these girls X Men, is yeah, what we, this we movie is We said that too. Doing. It's an X Men. It's a new mutant it's an, movie. It's an yep. X Men movie, which is thoroughly disappointing considering and, where this movie came from. And because that's the being first time, too. the first time you see a girl use her powers, she shoves a kid into a locker. The first. Yeah. That's, where, that's our baseline. That's where we're starting with these witch powers. Is it, you can throw a kid across the room. Right. That, yeah. That's it. And then it elevates so quickly. Like, mm-hmm. the things in the first movie, and uh, again, uh, the first movie's going to come up. Uh, the things in the first movie that were, like, monumental achievements of them uh, practicing their witchcraft and becoming stronger are glazed over so quickly in this movie yeah. just so they can have, like, oh, I can light my fingers a lighter now. I can do my makeup can... and make myself look pretty for Instagram. Like, that's their powers. R- like... And the, you can see auras. Uh, and they're just, it's so, this movie is so shallow. Um mm-hmm in what it's trying to achieve and it's so uh, don't go back to the writing again the writing is bad your yeah. bad guy ends up being david decuffney in his little new balance sneakers like you i i'm so frustrated with this movie because i could it's the the naked um agenda of this movie there are better ways to the message they wanted in this movie there are way better ways to do it and this is just surface level um and maybe i'm wrong tell me wrong but this feels like surface level uh feminism oh it is it is like like buzzword wokeness yeah it is it's It's buzzword this is buzzword wokeness it is there's no depth to it well we'll put it on screen uh and and this is just in those themes it fails it also fails as just a a a general movie and that we have no um Motive? There, I there's can't no, tell there's you the no girls' motive. names. There's, there's, I couldn't uh, either. Um, the only reason we knew part of their na- some of their names is because we had closed captioning on. Yeah. That yeah. was the only reason we knew some of their names. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're, there's no... I guess they're, they, they get into it. It's just rushed. It's a very rushed movie. They get into yeah. powers. They <laughs> talk about their powers like they're X-Men as well. There were, there's, there were countless times that... Michaela, Toby, and I, all three of us would look at each other and be like, did I miss something? Multiple times during this yeah. movie. Yeah, there's certain there, scenes that the editing moves to a certain area where you're just like, why are we doing this? There's one specific thing, Holly and I, we talked about it at length, but that I really want to like pick apart from this movie. And it's not really a spoiler or anything, but it is something that needs to be addressed. Is that there is a scene, it's, it's like a blink and you miss it scene in this movie where an obviously coded gay kid is being bullied by someone and their response to this gay individual being bullied is to turn the bully's coat rainbow colored 
Okay, this yeah. is okay to to it's to so solve deaf. bullying it's by being so like, no, deaf. you're gay is straight up homophobia. And I cannot believe that was in a movie in 2020. Yeah, right? a the movie that prides itself so on being buzzword yeah. woke yeah. is doing yeah. this. Why would you yeah, why would you make that as a haha, I got back at you? Now and you're gay. That's and that's symbolism as a negative. Like now yeah. you're this. And right. this movie, it comes across as a negative in that. This movie feels so detrimental to the things it supposedly wants to draw attention to that it's in, it is insulting. Right, as far yeah, exactly. As I'm concerned. And like, I'm sorry, you don't get points for being buzzword woke in one scene when you follow up that scene with a joke like that. No. Yeah, that yeah. And, the, uh, and if we get to the less serious stuff, just the dialogue is corny as shit. Like mm-hmm. where, where she's talking about, like, oh, was she? Uh, oh, snaps. Like, yeah. yeah. The girls are mean to each other too. <laughs> there were there were several times that I was like, I don't know a lot of teenagers, but I know they don't talk like this. Right. There yeah. are hairpin turns in friendships. Where she's like, whoa, after they've all been doing spells in a montage for a half an hour, the group breaks up because one of them did an extra spell on a dude. Yeah. And that whole inclusion of that, but they're, the movie is supposed to be about these four women who are coming into their powers and who are growing their strength. And this movie is nothing, this movie is about the men in their lives. This movie is all about men. It's this all movie about is not men. about it, it's it's and which if you okay like the one male character Timmy like I appreciate what they're trying to do with him sure but do that in your Covenant remake don't do that in my craft movie <laughs> right this is like what what are we why are we focusing on this guy like the the trouble should be between our four main characters and some other stuff and we've got the Covney and the mom and the friend Timmy and the we three don't... brothers the three brothers what is that. Her? What is this bullshit? It's the weirdest, most obvious. Like they're having, they're trying to do like get out shit where they're having a meeting in a living room and it feels cultish. It feels like Black Christmas of 2019 or 20. I forgot when it came out. There's a link to that where there's just like, it's the male cult and the females must fight back against it. Put all that shit in your movie, but you got to do it better. Otherwise, you're going to turn a lot of people off. I, well, I, there's I, a lot just make of like subtext, right? Where uh, subtext and subtlety filming. is gone. Yeah. Well, I mean, but there's Invisible no Man is a good movie. movie. I think that has like a potent, you know, modern subtext to it. But it's a movie first. Like this is the plot of the movie, and it's right. like right. baked in. But right. you, you are getting a, a lot of these, like, uh, yeah, I guess you're calling the woke horror movies, where it's like, here's what we're, here's the movie that we're talking about, and underneath that, there's a horror movie. And like another like another way that the the focus shifts to men in a really strange way, Sean. That I was wondering, Holly and I discussed it. But I wonder if you noticed it too. Is that like the opening scene in this movie? One of the characters gets her period in public so heavily that she like it is dripping onto the floor. Like it is straight up like miscarriage level blood. That is not. It normal. is. It's. It is. It is completely on. And you're right. It is miscarriage level blood. Now again, mm-hmm. I'm not a woman. I don't know uh, uh, how. Uh, bad it can get i can't imagine it's but she didn't notice it when it was that right. someone had to point it out to her like right and but okay then later on there's a scene with a used condom and they go to austin powers levels to avoid showing it like they will not show it on screen Re- uh, uh, <laughs> that that was so i'm like they're not gonna go through with are they really and they did yeah i it really is it is it is they take great pains to not show immature it. yeah Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, it's a it very is. immature movie. That's a very good word for it, Sean. It's a really immature movie. Yeah, it all it's... counts. And we haven't even gotten to the like the way the plot just crumbles in the third act. Oh yeah. God. It's someone I needs mean... to explain to me what David Duchovny's motive is, because I still don't know. Right. It I... is such it feels I'm like, like I... such a basic archaic thing for him that I don't know if it's coming because it feels like um, the, his stereotype is such a it is such a I don't know how to a solid stereotype like it is it is almost too cartoony of a stereotype yeah, an evil to have stepdad. your bad guy act like this yes yeah, an evil stepdad yeah we've never seen that before right like right, right. <laughs> Who, who's all about uh, men are superior and women are not, and women should know their place. Like that, it feels like the most cardboard stereotype villain for your for this type of movie. And I, right. I feel like you're 
you're doing a disservice, obviously, to your other characters if your villain is, to me, this weak. Like, it's not helping anybody. Let me well, ask and, you. And Sean did. Sorry, go ahead, Colin. Well, I'm just curious. You know, I mean, you're, you're saying all this, and, you know, you'd said earlier about the lost art of subtlety. I mean, is it the. Do the filmmakers think you're stupid? That if they, you know, use this as subtext, that you're just not, you're going to miss it, you know? You may miss uh, what we're I, trying to tell you. I mean, they hit everything so hard in this movie. And honestly, this movie kind of feels unfinished, especially in the third act. Yeah, it does. It feels like major scenes are missing. So I don't know if they're overcompensating for that. Mm. But, but, there's, mean, but you're not getting that, like, I'm insulted by this movie kind of thing. It's like, well, I yeah, mean, I, would, I mean, I am, yeah, okay. but on yeah. multiple levels. Like, yeah. Sean, did you catch on? We were talking about all the, like, Christian sim like symbolism that I guess is just a red herring. Because, like, the oh. stepdad's name is Adam. The kids' names are, like, Isaiah, Jacob, oh. and Abe or something, right? right. They have a pet yeah. snake. They do. Like, but <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. No. Except those, they're the bad brothers. guys. Except they're the bad guys, yeah. and they're the they're the bad guys. They're douchebag bros, and it's everyone. They're so bad very guys, cardboard. but they're not Christian bad guys, Colin. There's a different direction that goes. They're not <laughs> Christian. I didn't I didn't like that they were reading the book uh, book called The Craft. Um, as uh, I don't like that the symbol like they're so obvious and like we're gonna point to this so you recognize it later in the movie. It's mm. so blatant. Mm -hmm. Like here, look at this. Look at the CGI book that we created. Why is the book CGI for some reason? Like, why they're, there's, they're using CGI in areas where I'm just like, why are you doing this? It, this like, makes make no sense. Book. Just make a book. Yeah, right. And, like, this is a minor gripe compared to, like, everything else that happens in this movie. But these girls aren't outcasts. Like, they, there's nothing outcast about them. They're not goth kids. They are just just seem like normal high school girls, honestly. Or, yeah. or it feels like they're trying too hard to be outcasts. Like, it feels like the out, uh, they don't feel, they feel, uh, I mean, well, yeah, like you said, they feel like the normal at this point. And, like, well, these kind no, of people are, are the cool kids now. There's no, like, real conflict in any of their lives, though, because, like, in the original, we get, like, Nev Campbell with all of her scars, and that's what she's dealing with. Yep. We get Rachel True is dealing with a racist bully, which, like, okay, you could put that in a movie now, and it would probably work better than it did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's like they don't have into they don't have any struggles like that. There is no, no central conflict. And there was no. and and that and talking about the girls like that makes me think of Michaela was very upset by the fleeting mention that one of the girls is trans. I was right. so mad because I was like, you want credit for having a trans character in a movie without doing anything with it. Like yeah. she just makes a comment about being trans and then she's like sidelined for the whole movie and doesn't have anything to do. It's like. They're not what, solid single characters. Yeah. Well, Plus, I mean, also when they're not fighting each other because they forego one of them being the bad guy in this one. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, and like we said earlier, like it's this movie about it's the craft. It's you know these young witches. We learn more about Timmy than anyone else. Right. That's it's what I'm saying. Timmy's Their focus movie. is all wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's Timmy's movie. Oh, Timmy. All right, so you're telling me not to see this movie because now I'm, Colin, no. now do I have to see it to know what you're no. talking <laughs> No, you don't. Colin, I, Colin, the only reason I want you to watch it is so we can all discuss it. Just to sit that's there the and fume. And like, right, <laughs> and that's it. It, is, it is just to fume at it. So right. you do what you want, uh, but I, I wouldn't normally recommend anybody watch this movie because it's, it's fucking terrible. They yeah, do to become... All yeah. To all our listeners, don't watch it, but Colin, yes, watch it. <laughs> yeah, Colin, you watch it. <laughs> Oh, maybe it's perfect movie for you. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it's a very, well, oh, the ending. Oh, oh, the ending. Oh, why? Oh, why would you do that? I've never wanted to like put my fist through my TV so much in my life. Like, did you, did anyone else just yell, don't you fucking dare at your I, TV? Well, as soon as, as soon as you started opening the door, I said, this better not be what I think it is. And I was like, are of you fucking kidding is. me? Can you guess it, Colin? No. I'm saving okay. this for the time. Okay. <laughs> well, and, right. I, I, again, I apologize for saying everything we said, but. Sean, it was funny because Toby said it earlier when we were watching the movie. He's like, I bet, and said what was going to happen. And we were like, but that doesn't make sense. That's not possible. The timeline then, doesn't add up if you think about it. It oh, doesn't add up. No, doesn't matter. No, Who's the mom? Somebody's uh, the daughter of Feruza Balk. No, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> So, All I'm saying well, is timelines don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I'm saying is this is a bad move. 
Wow. Well, now, yeah, things, now you don't I need to see it. <laughs> no, uh, it's a, it's unfortunate. Um, it feels like um, I because I also watch the quote unquote special features, which are the those two and a half minute like uh, uh, pieces that are just like um, <sighs> superficial. The superficial behind the scenes pieces that are you know, and even in them they showed a few scenes that had more. Like this movie, I feel was cut to bits. Like I don't know. It if this has is to the be. Film- it is. I feel like it was a lot of studio because during that montage, those are full scenes that they have just cut down to a montage. And so I'm curious to what happened. I'm not too curious about it because I don't think there's much that could save this movie. But I feel like this is probably cut by other people. I still don't think it would have saved it, but it's... Oh. Well, and just one final thought is like there's been a lot of criticism in the past about how much Jason Blum employs female directors and whatnot. And, like, I will say that since he made that comment, he has made an effort to employ more women. Um, but if this is the – this and Black Christmas is the best he can offer them, it's no wonder they don't want to work with him. Like, they're being set up for failure. Well, aren't they coming, like up, after watching this aren't they coming up with the, the scripts, though? Isn't this – did they – This was – I will say this was written by Zoe Lister-Jones, who also yeah. directed the movie. So oh. – uh, it's I mean, an opportunity, is... and it's like, well, I'd take that, you know. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a the famous, yeah. you know, it's got a famous title. Both yeah. of them did. Yeah. So it's and plus it's. So, I mean, it is, and we've seen uh, we've seen many people get in this way, mm-hmm. male directors as well, but who uh, will uh, work an existing property mm-hmm. like as a sequel or a new thing or a new version of a horror movie to get into the business. Um, oh, I don't know. but uh, yeah, I don't know. So. It's a discouraging practice that is happening now. Everybody yes. should stop it. <laughs> new truly, movies are like truly new, is. new ideas. Um, or you can, you know what, you can do an old idea and it's possible to do it well. It's just not. It makes me wonder if she had even seen the original or has any sort of connection to it because mm. it doesn't seem like it. I don't know. Well, she knew who. Well, she knew something about Fur is a Balk, right? Yeah. So we're saying <laughs> yeah. this is the greatest train wreck of the year. It's I bad, think so. Colin. Okay. It's real bad. It's real bad. I mean, there, I mean, there are other things that came out. Like I said, someone make, made me watch Eurovision, and I wanted to stab my eyes out. But I don't want to talk about that. The craft, I was offended by. Yeah. There's a lot to dissect with it. We could do yeah. like a full two to three hours on everything. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that would it would have really been a good like full episode. Yeah. So does anyone have any honorable mentions that for any of the categories that they want to, you know, throw out there real quick? Uh, yeah, Tenet. Uh, <laughs> Colin, I want to talk to you about this movie. I don't really. Um, uh, <laughs> all I want to say is that I think, uh, I don't know why, but Christopher Nolan likes to take really simply, simple concepts and make them so intricate you can't figure them out. Like, he just likes to take... He likes fancy words, it feels like. And this tenant feels like a fancy word when you could just say it simpler. Um, he does, there are, don't get me wrong, there's some cool stuff in that movie. Yeah. And the technology. Large and the scale, technology, practical, like giant scale action that's pretty right. thrilling. And, you know, yeah. It, it, and it is because also the way they're doing it, mm-hmm. because it's, I mean, you know, it, you've the seen technique. stuff, it's backwards yeah, at certain yeah, points. Yeah. Like the technology and the shooting is, it's top notch. Like I've never seen any stuff like that before. Mm-hmm. And it's really unnerving in some moments. Like um, where the, one dude scooching across the floor yeah. in his full yeah. gear and it, like stuff meant to be scary. Um, but it was also like, I got an hour into that movie. I had no fucking clue what was going on. Well, that that's because, the problem. And I've had to watch it with the subtitles on to actually, cause yeah. Cause I'm like, I want to follow this. I mean, like what's actually, what are we saying? Cause it has uh it hurdles ahead so fast and there it's all exposition for at least an hour. Yes. It's it exposition is an hour without exposition. a break because yes. the mechanics of its central concept, which is really cool. This is a cool yes. sci-fi concept that cool you know, concept. Red Dwarf and Doctor Who has already plowed this, uh, you know, this terrain. But um, it's so, and it's basically grafted onto like a James Bond narrative. I mean, you can basically yeah. see all the correlations of who the characters are. So it's a James Bond movie, but we're going to do it with a sci-fi thing. But I didn't understand why the characters were making the decisions they were making because they're making the decisions based on an understanding of a concept that I was struggling to get my head around. Cause it's like, I'm going to tell you this, you know, and I'm like, but how does that work? 
And then I'd right. sit there and try and figure that out. And by the time I had it figured out, or if I even could get a grasp on it, the movie was like three scenes ahead. And then I was like, what the? F-? Yeah. So this is, is this that is my problem, problem or his problem? No. I think it's his problem. It's his problem because he doesn't um, like, I think it's nearest. Um, the nearest thing we can compare it to is um, uh, Inception, because that also has a central complicated process or uh, a mechanism in the movie that is kind of central to it but they take mm-hmm. the time to yeah. give us a character in Elliot Page in that they can explain it to her Yeah. Um, so they have an audience character this movie yeah. if it's supposed to be John David Washington he um, he understands two thi- things too, too quickly for yeah. the audience to also um, yeah. understand them at the same time and That's that is exactly the problem it. with this movie yeah because he's going oh yeah so we got to do this and you're like but Wait a second. <laughs> right. I don't know what's going on. And if I don't know what's going on, then I don't care. That's why we got an hour into this movie. Also, once you get past the part of like the sound design and actually understanding what they're saying, oh, the sound what they're terrible. saying aggressive. is so what the sound design is aggressively. The sound design. Uh, it is just, you can't understand what people are saying. Nothing. It's aggressive. I don't know why he does shit like this and doesn't, fix it he did it with like dark knight rises and then had all complaints about it um but also when you do actually hear what they're saying i don't care i don't care what a russian oligarch is doing with plutonium like this the story is too uh too high-minded for me to give a shit about it i don't care if they're stealing gold bars or uh you know he's got a wife and he's living on yachts and shit like at a certain point it is a James Bond high espionage thing, but it, but they're really talking about things. I'm just like, am I watching C-SPAN with bullets flying? Yeah. And, and that's what it feels like to me. Yeah. Um, it is it is an inaccessible movie as far as I'm concerned, mm-hmm. and I don't think that's going to make you. But I think that's uh, going to make a certain segment of the the audience go back and rewatch it, and rewatch it, and rewatch yes. it. You know, over a period of time and try and dissect it. And I've already seen like the complicated graphs of you know like yeah. what's actually happening in the movie. So. I mean, there is something to be said. You know, again, maybe I'm I'm stuck in a position. If you're attacking it, I'm going to defend it, right? Devil's advocate. Well, no, I mean, but but I'm I still am admitting it. I can't fucking like that movie. I get what's going on, right? But then you get to the point where like, well, why do I care what's going on? Because your central character is essentially a blank slate. He's you know, yeah. When you're and he's pretending to be other people in a movie where you're just like, what the? So he comes off as like uh, you can't read him. Right. Well, yeah, he's pretending to be other people in a movie where he's also not being he's never himself yeah. at any point. Yeah, like yeah, he is yeah. it is not a strong role for a guy who I believe can be a strong actor based on Black Klansman. I haven't seen him in much, but I feel like he's got more to offer, but he does nothing for me in this movie. Yeah. Like he is blank robotic. Like I and I'm sure that's how he's supposed to be, but it does nothing for that main character. Because that's part of the James Bond appeal. I think you got to be right. suave and kind of detached, but it doesn't really work. And I, yeah, yeah. So I haven't All seen right. this movie, um, and I have like a high bandwidth of tolerance for for Nolan and his his bullshit. I I just I really like it usually, but I saw one review that I feel like is how I would feel about it, and it just said that it feels like Nolan took all the criticisms that are lofted at his movies put them in one movie to prove he could do it but he couldn't do it it is it is this movie is so nolan-y it's, it's very so self-indulgent nolan. yeah that would <laughs> very be yeah, sec- yeah but everything that is a trademark or a look of his other movies mm-hmm. it is all the way there yeah. the other problem i've always had with nolan movies his explosions don't feel real to me they feel like they're setting off uh charges on it feels like a set and he's blowing little stuff it's everywhere they're real explosions it is. <laughs> not it, cg it, it, explosions they're real right, but i want <laughs> right, but, no, but i want movie explosions yeah. i want you know i want action usa explosions right you drive yeah, through yeah. a corner of a house and, and a then it just suddenly explodes. explodes yeah yeah i have some gripes with that it is very nolan Ooh boy yeah did any of you other guys have uh honorable mentions yeah, I would like to talk about the, my other competitor for best of the year a little bit. I know, Colin, you've seen it. I don't know if anybody else has. Um, the Color Out of Space. Mm-hmm. Ah, so I haven't I, not watched it yet. I really liked it a lot. I guess the only thing holding me back from keeping it my number one is that, like, there's only one way it could have ended, you know? Um, I feel like there was really no other outcome. And, like I said, it's based on an existing IP, so that takes it down a few points for me. But... I was shocked by how gross and gooey and colorful and gory it was. It 
it has literally every type of horror in it. It's not just one type. But I was surprised by that. I was surprised by the the reaches and the power of this color and how many different ways it can fuck up your life. Um, <laughs> it was great. Nicolas Cage starts off very normal, but then it slowly ratches it up and you get a Cage Rage freak out. Very normal. Steering wheel. He starts it's out great. as an alpaca farmer. <laughs> but, right, but it's Nicolas Cage trying to play it as buttoned down as he can, like as Colin, he's capable of. Which I believe Nick Cage does, right? Like, I mean, I, that's, that's it. Feels like uh, no, I mean, it feels like like that makes sense. Yeah, yeah this guy owns castles. He has samurai point. sword collections. <laughs> Alpaca farmer seems like it tracks with him. You know, yeah. Um, it's it, yeah. It was it was a really great movie. I think like Richard Stanley should be proud of this being his like return yeah. to the industry. It, it's it's a good movie and i really think it kind of got lost in the shuffle of this year so i think people should really go back and check it out i think it'll be a cult classic in 20 years i think it'll be the 80s blob the way we feel about that now that will be the color out of space 20 years from now yeah it's a good double feature i think with i mean it's an hp lovecraft adaptation but i think you can pair that really well with uh, i think from beyond would you put that uh that in- absolutely yeah so watch Absolutely. those two movies together <laughs> or the void the new movie the I void but that. i think uh yeah from beyond and and the color out of space <sighs> holly anything um i mean like i said earlier i really liked um the vast of night that was a really interesting movie um it's very unique it was very uh twilight zoney but in a really good way um it's kind of a slow burn but I really enjoyed it. I don't know that I've really seen a lot like it, especially this year. Um, so as far as like uniqueness and it's really beautiful. It's, you know, Colin mentioned the one shot. It's, I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting movie. I, I liked it a lot. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's a slow burden, but I still really enjoyed it um, watching. And I was like, I'm watching something that I haven't really seen before. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that. Um, nice. yeah, yeah it has a nice so I would style recommend to it, checking yeah. it out. What's that? It has a nice style to it. Yeah. It has a really nice mm-hmm. style, and that that's what really drew me. It takes place in like the like the 1950s, so that's just kind of a cool time anyway. And it's it's about um, based around a, a guy who's a, a disc jockey, and he's friends with um, a telephone operator, and they're both kids. Like a telephone operator is like part time; she's like 16 years old, <laughs> and he's a disc jockey who's like you know 19. He's just getting started. Um, but they find this like strange radio frequency that's interrupting both of their communications. Um, and they're kind of trying to track it because it's something they've never heard before or experienced before. And it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting movie. I, yeah. I think it's really cool. I would recommend it. it does a lot of um, that theater of the mind stuff, you know, where yeah, the characters are sure. relating stories and you get to imagine. Yeah. I mean, for a limited yeah. budget, it has like, you know, it, uh, it captures your, attention it really does there's some there's some really great monologuing in that movie um yeah it really, it really paints a picture all right really well cool. that and uh, hunter hunter have gone up on my list yeah you should check that out i also really liked freaky just putting that out there i know a lot of people think it's gonna be oh, yeah, i still haven't i enjoyed it i, I still haven't watched it, it. yeah i liked it, that it was uh sincere in what it did and it wasn't mean-spirited it's exactly okay. what you think it's gonna be but in a really fun way it's Good. very Chris Landon. He he yeah. has plot devices that he will never give up, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be groundbreaking. It's not going to be, you know, an Oscar movie, but it's fun. As long as it's, it's a good fun. Time. It was nice to genuinely laugh at Vince Vaughn for the first time in <laughs> 15 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I got two maybe uh, the honorable mentions that are coming immediately to mind. Uh, I watched a movie called Scare Me which I enjoyed quite a bit. It's a horror anthology movie, but it doesn't dramatize the anthology segments. It's basically these two horror authors end up uh, in a you know vacation resort together in the winter, and because the power goes out, they tell each other stories. So it's kind of like done with sound effects as they're telling these stories, so you imagine them, but it is an anthology movie. It's kind of uh unique in that way i was sitting there going like man i'm having a lot of fun with this and i don't you know recall seeing it done this way before you know usually you would break it this would be the wraparound story and then you break it out and actually uh you know film the individual segments and the other one 
which you're probably maybe going to crucify me for. But uh, the reason it comes up is because I was looking over our list of what last year, what we chose, and we chose Crawl last year as one of the, the movies that we liked. We and I'm like, you know what this year's Crawl was? It was underwater with uh, Kristen Stewart. <laughs> Because that was like, it is of the same level of, uh, you know, unassuming, uh, like we're going to do a movie, this is a story that you've seen done dozens of times before, and I think that was my criticism of, of it when I first saw it. Like, well, I saw Leviathan, yes. and I saw Deep Star 6, and we've seen The Abyss, and other, and Life, I guess, was the recent one that I think would I would compare this to, where it's, right. you know, a crew on a base that's in an inaccessible place and then there's you know monsters and uh this is your underwater um horror movie of 2020 i don't know it's it's fun it has a lot of problems but it has very cool designs it seems like it's uh got a higher budget than it probably did and uh yeah if you like underwater monster movies underwater i am shocked that you, <laughs> there you like go. To scare me yeah, I'm, I'm shocked you liked that movie. I hated that movie, and Damn. I'm surprised you liked it because it relies so heavily on comedy that it doesn't seem like something you would like. Yeah, but so did that was what surprised me about Wolf of Snow Hollow. I didn't go into that expecting. But that's an comedy. actual movie, not just people sitting in a room telling a story. Yeah, but that's it. Still had I thought it still had like a it had a plot trajectory for its characters. It was that's why I kind of like you know was like oh I see where this guy is going. And then by the end, I'm like, oh, wow, you're, you're going like in, you know, all the well, way. You should with definitely this. watch the boys then because Aya Cash is in that. OK. OK. All right. So. Yeah, I, had, I mean, I had I had issues with scare me. I enjoyed parts of it. I, I did like the storytelling. I thought it was a unique angle, um, but I definitely had issues. With it. I know Michaela and I talked about it a little bit. and I think I had some of the same issues that she had with that. Um, but I, I agree. I'm surprised that you like that movie, Colin. Truly. It. To so me, it I. just felt like an excuse for improv comedians to just try out their material for two hours. Oh, no. That sounds yeah. horrible. <laughs> Sean, it's literally two people in a room acting out their stories. Yeah, they're acting That's out it. their That's stories. That's the whole movie. Hey, yeah. the pizza guy's enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point, yeah. it was too little too late for me. Like, how did I, how yeah, did I really I dug this. All three of you saw this, and how did I miss yeah, this? Yeah, it, it was like a this. Shutter premiere. And I would actually okay. argue it's not an anthology, because I think an anthology applies independent stories this is people in a room in one room literally the whole movie telling stories yeah. to each other i don't but think that's they, an anthology. each one well that's why i'm saying like this to me struck me as like this is a new model for like an anthology uh, maybe i don't want to see anybody else do it i'm like okay this is a different way of doing it where you can have the characters tell several different stories and do it that way. It's like okay, and they act it out. You know, like but as you're the still shadows in the same do room things. The whole time. And, yes, so it is. It's a theater of the mind thing. I guess that's an anthology yeah, that, it, that you hear. But when you tell me anthology, I'm thinking I'm going to see each of these stories actually play out. Right. And you don't in this, and so that's why I think anthology is the wrong word for it, and it set my expectations in the wrong place for this movie. Mm. And I think that like it really feels like a vanity project because the writer director and lead actor are all the same person. That's right. Yeah. True. All right. So I guess that wraps up our year. Cause I know we're going to talk about uh wishmaster 84. I mean, wonder woman 84. I was going to yeah, say you, we could start, but you, it'll be hard to stop. <laughs> all three of you watched this last night. And uh, if you want to discuss it, I don't know. I'm just kidding. The, the more I think about it, just the more mad I get. Once I yeah. start, I won't be able to stop with this movie. So. You know what? Write into us if you want to hear about our thoughts on Wonder Woman eighty four. <laughs> yeah, Wishmaster eighty four is, is more accurate. 84. Yeah. If you ever wanted to see a PG version of Wishmaster, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! All right. Well, thanks for sticking with us this long, and uh, happy New Year. Um, next week we're going to be. Oh, first of all, we should probably tell you uh, how again we can uh, you can get a hold of us and follow along on our social media. We're on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Also on Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. Please email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, next week we are watching a movie chosen by... You! 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 That's right. We don't even know what it is because you've no. been voting and now the results are all in and tabulated and we don't know what it is yet. And so it's going to be a surprise to us as we watch the first of uh, the four listener picks 
that you suggested and voted for starting next week. So we hope that you will join us then again. Uh, bid farewell to 2020 and welcome 2021 uh, <laughs> with Thank the Saturday Night Free Show. Good riddance. Yeah. So, um, yeah, take care. Good well. Good luck. And good night.